Welcome to Knowledge Graphs. I am Harald Sack and let me introduce you to my team. We have Sasha Bruns, Anton Tabia Tietz and Masa Wafaye. And what I'm going to do now is, of course, we will introduce you to the subjects of this lecture. Let's start with week number one. Week number one, we are doing knowledge representation with graphs. First of all, we have to make clear what is knowledge and how does it differ from data. Pure data is raw. It doesn't have any meaning and we have to put context, information and stuff, everything together to come up in the end with knowledge. How this works and to analyze this in a bit more precise way, we have the very first part of the lecture from data to knowledge. Of course, knowledge representation is one of the important issues that we are after, so that will be the subject that follows directly our first part of the lecture. And when we are talking about knowledge, of course, we also have to talk about how to understand that knowledge. Understanding is more than just reading. It's an art form. We have to correctly interpret information that is brought to us. So this is the first part of the lecture series here in week number one. And then we continue with an intuitive art or way of knowledge representation, which is simply by graphs on the one hand side and on triples. Putting things together then are the so-called knowledge graphs. We are explaining what exactly is a knowledge graph to represent knowledge here based on graph technology. And the vision where this, this leads to is the so-called semantic web. So we will introduce you into the architecture of the semantic web technology stack. So this is all of the technology that we will be talking about in the subsequent weeks, how to represent knowledge and how to make use of that later on based on knowledge graphs. And one of the simple things there are specific principles that are followed. And this is first the linked data principles. We will learn about what is linked data as a specific form of the semantic web, which is closely related also to knowledge graphs. And of course, what happens if we take together all that linked data that is on the web and then we will reach something which is called the web of data. For all of these weeks, as well as also in the first week, we have additional hands-on created for you that introduce you really to things how to do then by yourself. For example, graph creation from text or the art of understanding with natural language processing or how to resolve natural language processing ambiguities. Hi, I'm Sasha Bruns and I will give you a short overview of the lecture two, Basic Knowledge Graph Infrastructure. In 2.1, we will talk about how to identify, distinguish and access things on the web. In particular, we will talk about apples and why they are not as simple as it seems. Then we will talk about how to represent simple facts with RDF, why we need triples and what RDF it is and why do we need it. Then we will move to the uh, turtle serialization, yes, a way to encode RDF graphs. In 2.4, we will talk about vocabularies, semantics and meaning. We will talk about um, RDFS, a schema that is used to describe facts and thin and so on. Uh, in 2.5, we will move to the complex data structures. We will talk about lists, containers, collections and how to work with them, how to um, achieve something more with them. In excursion one, we will talk ad about RDF verification and RDF star. Sometimes RDF triples are just not enough and uh, we will need some kind of some way to make statements about statements. And this is what we will talk about. In 2.6, we will talk about logical inference with, R with RDFs and in particular how to uh, deduce or bring new knowledge to um, the knowledge what is explicitly mentioned. And in excursion two, we will talk about RDF A, RDF and the web, how to connect RDF and HTML. And of course, we will have two practical hands-on where we will um, show you how to work with RDF and Jupyter notebooks or Colab notebooks. Yes, we will talk about how to serialize or vis visualize our graphs and also how to uh, manipulate the graphs, how to bring new information, how to delete information and how to benefit from it. Hello, I'm Tabia Tietz and I will give you a brief overview of lecture number three. 
Last week you learned how what knowledge graphs are and how data is represented. And now, of course, we have to also learn how to query this. And this is why the week number three is about querying knowledge graphs with Sparkle. In the first lecture, we will learn very basic Sparkle functionalities, how to perform your first Sparkle queries, what the syntax looks like in Sparkle, and so on. And then we will take you on a small excursion. We will take a look at two of the largest knowledge graphs out there, which are DBpedia and Wikidata. We will show you how they are created, how to query them, and then also what kind of interesting knowledge there is to explore for us. And then we will continue with Sparkle and we will show you a bit more complex queries, um, for example, how to filter the results in interesting ways so that it's really useful for you and that you can um, try out different things. And then we will talk about Sparkle subselect and property paths, which will also be very handy for you. And then we will find out in lesson number five, that Spark is more than a query language and we can do even more. And of course, it's also very important that we talk about quality assurance here. And this is um, when we introduce you to the shackle constraints. And as in every week, we also have some practical hands-on sessions prepared for you. And in this week, we have three Colab notebooks for you. And in the first two, you will learn how to query knowledge graphs with Sparkle, in the first one with Wikidata, and in the second with DBpedia, where we have some really interesting and also fun uh, queries prepared for you. And in the, sec in the third, hands-on, we will talk about Sparkle Query Federation, where we will also uh, introduce some smaller knowledge graphs to query, uh, for example, one about performing arts data. So stay tuned and I'm looking forward to see you there. Hi, my name is Mahsa Vafoy and I will give you a brief overview of what we are going to do in the fourth week of this lecture. So in the fourth week we will start with a brief history of ontology from its definition in philosophy to its definition in computer science. So from Aristotle to AI, we will together explore the meaning of ontology. And afterwards, we will get to the topic of logic. We expect that you're already familiar with mathematical logics, but still we will provide a recap of um, the propositional logic and first order logic in one excursion. But since these kinds of mathematical logics are not strong enough to describe ontologies. We will move on to the next ex excursion where we provide uh, an introduction to description logics. Later on, we will introduce you to the web ontology language OWL and we will show you what possibilities it gives you to create an ontology and how you can use OWL to provide um, definitions for different classes and relations that you want to have in your ontology. Eventually we will finish this week up with two hands-on in which you will see how you can create your own ontology using the online version of Protege and how you can import this in the desktop version and what possibilities you have with Protege in creating an ontology. Hi, my name is Anne Pan. I'm here to give you a brief overview of week five, ontological engineering for smarter knowledge graphs. So in the past lecture, you've seen or you were introduced to the web ontology language. Now, OWL is very expressive, but there are limits to OWL. And also because of expressivity, there is also undecidability. So in Excursion 7, we will introduce Semantic Web Rule Language, or SWIRL, which is a combination of data log, a logical rule language, and OWL. SWIRL is there so that we can fix the problem of undecidability, and also it is computationally efficient for reasoners. So in 5.2, we will introduce to you a workflow for designing your own ontology. Here, we give you a step-by-step -step guide on how to come up with an ontology. On 5.3, we will then tell you how to better design your ontologies. And in this case, we will talk about ontology evaluation. 
in 5.4, we will talk about ontological engineering, particularly ontological alignment and ontological learning. So learning from text or other information resources. In 5.5, we will tell you how to construct your knowledge graph. So you have an ontology. How do you fill your knowledge graph with data? So you can do this using unstructured data or structured data. And lastly, for this week, we will talk about best practices, particularly in terms of ontology uh, design, as well as constructing your knowledge graph. So as with the previous lectures, we also provide practical hands-on. So we start out with knowledge graph construction from unstructured text using natural language processing techniques. And in 5.2, we will show you how to construct your knowledge graph or fill it with data with open refine from a structured data source. And lastly, we will give you a background or um, introduction and also practical hands-on on the semantic web rule language. Week six, there comes the last lecture, intelligent applications with knowledge graphs and deep learning. First of all, what we are going to do is to look deeper into the graph in knowledge graphs. We all know, of course, knowledge graphs are based on graph structures. However, we have to formally define what exactly is a graph and to find out, of course, how can we analyze the graph and how can we make use of the results of the graph analysis for further purposes. One of the things we have in mind there is also to use, for example, knowledge graphs in the terms of knowledge graph embeddings. So this, of course, is rather similar to distributional semantics in language models. You might have heard of language models and there, of course, each word or the meaning of words of a text is uh, expressed by exactly its use within the language. So this is distributional semantics. However, in the same way, you can also explain or come up with describing the structure of a knowledge graph and also the properties of a knowledge graph. Simply by looking for, for example, determining which nodes in the knowledge graph are similar, you are simply looking for nodes that have a similar environment, so that have similar neighbors, that are encased in similar relations with each other, for example. And by using exactly that size, same uh, design paradigm, you can create knowledge graph embeddings, which are then representations, vector representations of the knowledge graphs, usually in dense vectors, which on the other hand transport the inherent semantics of the knowledge graph with them, which means similar nodes are then also close in closely neighborhood in the vector space, as well as similar relations are in close neighborhood within the vector space. What use can it be? Of course, then you can make knowledge graphs directly accessible for so-called graph representation learning. So you take the graph as input for your machine learning problems that you want to solve. For example, what we can do is we can solve classification tasks. However, there is a much more important task. For example, when we consider knowledge graph, we all know that none of these knowledge graphs is really complete. And the world, of course, it represents, it's also changing dynamically. So it's always clear that there are facts that are missing. And what we can do, of course, based on these embeddings, is so-called knowledge graph completion. We could do link prediction, simply to find out, stochastically, what would be an appropriate link that is just missing in that knowledge graph we are looking for. And this, of course, gives way then also to error correction, to completing knowledge graphs, as well as to fact checking. So we will see how these things here come together and we will compare then also knowledge graphs to the latest developments within large language models. We all know that large language models nowadays each week or every month a new one is appearing and everybody is in awe because of the capabilities of this new model and of the understanding and intelligent it might to, to show. And the problem there is, as we have all seen, most of these language models nowadays cannot be fully trusted, so they make errors, they hallucinate and stuff like that. And thereby knowledge graphs which, expresent, uh, which represent explicit knowledge, which can be trusted, 
is a nice complement for many tasks related with language models, like for example fact-checking or explanations. Followed by that, of course, we then have two tasks at the end of our lecture there. It's semantic search, so how can we improve the traditional information retrieval process by including semantic technology? And moreover then, how can we change this traditional retrieval process and open it up to a exploration of the search space by opening up the stuff for exploratory search which is closely related to recommendation and recommender system. So this is the subjects we are going to talk about in the final week of the lecture. Complemented is all this again by two hands-on. In the first one we will show you how to do network analysis, so we will put in practice what we have learned here in the very first part in the graph in knowledge graphs and in the second hand on we will introduce you to knowledge graph completion using trans e which is a specific knowledge graph embedding model and with that we come then to an end of the lecture and now brace yourself or relax lean back enjoy and watch the first lecture